Okay, so where did we leave off? We were talking about um, non-quadratic cost functions, and uh, we derived a PDE uh, similar to the Mojampere equation. Uh, I'm going to just finish with one last example uh, with that, and then we're going to move on to something else. Um, so let me just remind you what the PDE was. It was that the determinant of okay, the Hessian of h, h was our cost function, evaluated at grad h inverse of grad u minus d squared u. K was equal to the determinant of d squared h. Again, evaluated at this point times f divided by g. And now we put our map in here. And our map was x minus grad h inverse of grad u. OK, and then we had the condition that this matrix is positive semi-definite uh, and that our map takes us into our target set. <coughs> OK, so uh, let's just do a quick example. We saw last time if we do quadratic cost, we get back to motion pair equations, so that's just good. Um, here's another example just to see what this would maybe look like in practice. Um, so what I'm going to assume is that I have two parallel planes. And I have one density supported on this plane and another density supported on a parallel plane. And my cost is going to be the L1 distance between them. Okay, so if we do an L1 cost between parallel planes, okay, so one plane is, one density is out here, one density is out here. And these are a distance, say, L apart. <coughs> okay, then my cost is going to be okay, so my cost is going to be determined by the cost in the in this in this coordinates, which are two dimensional in this in this example. So that's z squared plus plus the separation of the planes. <coughs> All right, and we said that the cost is then equal to h of x minus y. Okay, so this is my transport cost. All right, now what do I need to know? Uh, I need to know some gradients of h. I need to know how to invert the gradient of h, and I need to know the Hessian of h. And I need to know what happens to the Hessian of h when I plug in this expression. OK, so let's compute some of these. Uh, so gradient of h. <coughs> OK, here, there's no real trick. Uh, so that's something that we'll need. Uh, I need to be able to invert this thing. OK, so we need the inverse of this. Let's set z over root z squared plus l squared equal to p. OK, um, so the gradient is equal to p. Now we want to invert this and solve for z. Given p, okay. So something like this. I think the easiest way to do it is to uh, square both sides. Uh, by square, I mean these are vectors. So dot this with itself. Dot this with itself. Uh, so you get z squared over z squared plus l squared equals p squared. And now we can at least solve for the magnitude of z. OK, so what do we have? We have z squared 1 minus p squared is equal to p squared l squared. <coughs> oh, 
OK, so we know the magnitude of z. The magnitude of z is equal to magnitude of p times l divided by root 1 minus p squared. Uh, I need a little bit more than that, right? I don't need just, just the magnitude. I need to solve for this guy itself. Uh, so what direction is he pointing in relative to p? Right, I'm taking a vector this length. I've got to rotate it till it's the right direction. Uh, and well, to figure out the right direction, I have to go back to before I squared everything. So that's back here. So given this, how does the direction of z and the direction of p compare to each other? They're the same, exactly. So the magnitudes are related like this. The directions are the same. So we're going to have that. Actually, I just have to remove these magnitude symbols. And this is now my inverse gradient. So this is grad h inverse evaluated at p. OK, that means I have an expression for my optimal map now in terms of these things, in terms of u. So my optimal map uh, is going to have this form, right? t of x and grad u is equal to x minus x minus grad h inverse evaluated at grad u. So this is going to be x minus L grad u over root 1 minus grad u squared. <coughs> OK, I need the Hessian of h. So I need to take second derivatives. Uh, so I'll give you the punchline and assume that you can work these out. Hessian of h, the ijth component, is going to be equal to either z squared plus l squared minus zi squared over z squared plus l squared to the 3 halves if i is equal to j. or minus zi zj divided by exactly the same thing, z squared plus l squared 3 halves, if i is not equal to j. Okay, so these are the elements of my Hessian. Now what I really want is my Hessian evaluated at grad h inverse. <clears throat> so I'm going to take this expression and put it in place of in place of z everywhere in here. Uh, so one more step. Again, I'm going to do this simplification and just give you the result, but it's just algebra. So d squared h evaluated at grad h inverse. OK, uh, the ij component, it, it ends up simplifying really nicely. Uh, so again, put this in, in place of my z, and what do I get? I get 1 minus pi squared root 1 minus p squared over l, and minus pi pj. And then the rest of the factors are the same if i is not equal to j. Um, this, this I can kind of write in a compact way. Uh, 
Okay, I've got these ones on the diagonal, obviously. Um, but other than that, I have the same factor multiplying everything. And what I really have, okay, here I have a minus pi pj. Here I also have a minus pi pj uh, because i is equal to j. So I could write this thing in a really compact form. Okay, and what is it? It's going to be uh, root 1 minus p squared over l times the identity minus p, p transpose. So this is, this is an, not an inner product, but the outer product. <coughs> hey, uh, the determinant of this thing uh, ends up having a simple form. The determinant of all of this, the Hessian of h, uh, evaluated at grad h inverse of p is equal to, okay, all of this gets raised to the uh, nth power, depends on the dimension, because it's multiplying every row. And then you just have the determinant of this guy, which ends up being 1 minus p squared. Okay, so we end up with 1 minus p squared to the n over 2 plus 1 divided by L to the n. And that's basically it. That's the, the, those are the terms that we have to calculate out. And it's, you know, it's messy, but it's just algebra. So what is our PDE at the end of the day? PDE is going to be the determinant of, OK, we had uh, this matrix, first of all. So root 1 minus. Now in place of P, I have grad u, grad u squared divided by L, I minus grad U, grad U transpose, minus the Hessian of U, okay, which is equal to this determinant. So 1 minus grad U squared, N over 2 plus 1 over LN times f divided by g evaluated at my map. And my map, I said, was x minus l grad u over root 1 minus grad u squared. OK, so if I want to solve optimal transfer with this cost, I need to solve, OK, this PDE subject to this matrix being positive semi-definite and subject to this term here living inside my target set. <coughs> Any questions? That's messy, but it's just you know basic algebra and calculus in principle to, to write it down, to solve it. It's probably not just basic algebra and calculus. Um, L2 cost, uh, we saw the quadratic cost, we saw things uh, get nice and simple. And, and we can do this for a lot of different cost functions. <clears throat> and there's a, there's a list of, of conditions uh, that we need our cost to satisfy to be able to do this, which uh, some of the, most of these are kind of are kind of obvious, I guess, and then one of them's not. But I'll say that all of this, so all the hand waving I kind of did last class, can be made rigorous. Okay, if <coughs> if our cost satisfies a few uh, basic conditions, and one maybe non-basic condition. Okay, uh, these are the so-called the MTW conditions. <clears throat> um, they were written down in a paper by Ma 
Schrodinger, and Wong. <clears throat> uh, so what do we need? We need some regularity in the cost function to make this all work. In particular, it needs to have continuous fourth derivatives. <clears throat> uh, this one should be obvious. Grad H needs to be invertible. Given that we wrote down grad H inverse, uh, that these two better exist. <coughs> hey, we want some kind of uh, non-degeneracy in this. Uh, again, okay, I, I, wrote, I erased that, but this was, we have the determinant of this thing. We want non-degeneracy here, so we want this to be non-zero. So the determinant of d squared h is not equal to 0. Um, and then the last one is a technical, I don't think I'm going to write it down even. You can look it up in the paper if you want to. It's a technical condition that needs to be satisfied by the higher derivatives. Uh, of the cost function. <coughs> uh, and I'll also say there are a lot of interesting costs that actually satisfy all of these conditions, including the funny technical one at the end. Uh, most of the costs that come up in, in optics problems satisfy these conditions. Quadratic cost certainly satisfies these conditions. Um, so, uh, so this isn't a limiting framework by any means. Yes? The first condition seems odd because it doesn't seem like we took the fourth derivative. Yeah, the, so the fourth derivatives pop up in this guy here, okay. which is also, uh, I, I don't have a whole lot of intuition for, for that condition. It's this long technical condition on combination of various higher order derivatives. So yeah, we did not use the pack this, that HSC for absolutely. Um, but you know, you need to you need to make rigorous all the way through. For example, when I was talking about C transforms, I kind of assumed things were smooth enough to make things work. Um, uh, so these are conditions that you need to, to get uh, to get regularity at least in the solutions to make, for the PDE to make some sense. Other questions on this PDE, non-quadratic cost, on pair type equations? If not, then I want to talk a bit about um, the Wasserstein metric, at least start talking about it today. <coughs> uh, the Wasserstein metric is becoming really useful in a lot of applications. I think once we're done talking about the Wasserstein metric, I'm going to move on to a couple of those applications, which are in geophysics which is one I've worked in a bit, and also in machine learning, uh, because several people have expressed interest in that. Uh, so, so that's really the goal of everything I'm going to say about the Wasserstein metric today and maybe next class is, is to build up the theory I need to then jump into some of those applications. <coughs> okay. Okay, so you know, you give me two probability measures, uh, and you give me a cost function, and we could solve an optimal transportation problem between those those measures. Uh, so if we want to say do optimal transport with cost C between uh, two probability measures. mu and nu, <clears throat> uh, let's say, let's say with cost, an LP type cost. Uh, then what would be, we be solving? We'd be solving either, either the Moj problem, right? We're looking for a map 
that pushes forward mu into nu. <coughs> and it minimizes the transportation cost. Or we're solving the Kantorovich problem. Uh, so in that case, we're looking for this optimal transport plan. Right? It tells us how, how we couple uh, things that live in our domain and things that live in our target. So an optimal transport plan between mu and mu, uh, such that we minimize, again, this transportation cost. Uh, if mu is equal to nu, what's the total transportation cost? What's that? Zero. zero, yeah. So if mu is equal to nu, we don't have to move anything anywhere, right? And the cost is zero. So if mu equals nu, the cost is zero. Uh, and we should have some sense that if mu and nu are far away from each other, right, uh, we've got to move mass a long ways, the, co the transportation cost is going to get higher. In some ways, this transportation cost gives us a way of defining a distance between measures mu and nu. <coughs> In fact, it exactly gives us a distance. It gives us a way of defining a metric between two probability measures. So the transport cost. Some gives us some kind of notion of a distance between mu and nu. <coughs> and this is an idea that's exploited by these Wasserstein metrics. OK, so let me take, I'm, I'm going to be looking at costs that look like this. Okay, So for all p bigger than or equal to 1, okay, we're going to define the Wasserstein p distance. Okay, as? Basically, our, tra our transportation cost, um, but we're going to do uh, the thing maybe that you would expect um, that you would do if you were looking at LP norms or something, uh, and raise it to the 1 over pth power. OK, so Wasserstein p distance between mu and nu is going to be equal to <coughs> the infimum overall transport plans of the transport cost raised to the 1 over p power. Okay, and a nice thing about this is that, as I said, this defines now a metric between mu and nu. Uh, so this is a theorem. Wp uh, defines or is a metric on the space of probability measures. OK, so what do I need to show? I want to show that this is a metric. Uh, you remember what properties does a metric have to have? Define 
What's that? Triangle. triangle inequality. Yes, we definitely need a triangle inequality. Uh, Okay, so what does that mean? That means that if I want to go from mu to nu, that's going to be less than if I stopped at an intermediate along the way. Okay, what else is true of a metric? It's symmetric. It's symmetric, yep. Symmetry, so WP mu nu is equal to WP mu mu. And one more. What's that? The zero, the, the zero condition, yeah. So it's positive, but it's, it's greater than or equal to zero, and it's zero only if we've plugged in equal things. Yeah. <coughs> okay, so what do we have? We have. Positivity, I guess, that WP mu nu is greater than or equal to zero with equality only if mu is equal to nu. OK, so this is a metric. So let's see if we can argue this. Um, number two, number two is kind of trivial, right? The, 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 pro the whole problem statement here is symmetric, uh, so it doesn't matter if I if I swap the order of these two things. So in terms of two, okay, this is immediate. Uh, what's the next easiest one to prove? The next easiest one to prove is probably positivity. <coughs> so if we want to do the proof of positivity, um, it's certainly greater than or equal to zero, right? So there's, there's no way of getting a negative Wasserstein metric. Okay, so we certainly have this condition. And we certainly have this condition, right? The distance between a metric and itself is zero. And again, there's no way to, there's nowhere to move anything, uh, so there's not going to be no no cost to moving it. Uh, so the last bit to to prove is suppose a metric is zero, did we actually start with the same measures? So let's suppose this is zero. Okay, then, and we, we showed before actually this infimum is a minimum. Okay, so then I can really find a transport plan that makes this zero. So then there exists a feasible transport plan such that, <clears throat> okay, so such that uh, x minus y to the p integrated against pi is equal to zero. Uh, what can I conclude from this condition? We've actually seen a statement like this before uh, when we talked about the transshipment problem, right? So do you remember what I concluded from that? Pi is zero on the same sets. So pi is zero on the same sets? So mu and uh, nu have to be the same. Yeah, so from that in the transshipment problem, we concluded that mu and nu were the same. So that was with a different feasibility condition than we have here. Uh, uh, do you remember what the first step in that reasoning was, though, just looking at this? Mu and nu were over set A. Mu and nu were over set A. They were operating on the same. 
Yeah, so OK. I, I see what you're saying. So yes, we're, we said something about how this measure, this measure is supported along, along the diagonal, right? Is it, we've got, if we put the same argument in both of these, then we can have mass. If we put different sets that are disjoint in here, then there's no mass. So yeah. In other words, it wants to operate over the same, over the same sets in both arguments. OK, so another way of saying this is pi is supported on this diagonal set uh, xy such that these guys are equal. Okay, now I want to show that the metrics have to be equal. That was the last condition. This was then, where did it go? There, this was an if and only if. So this is equal to 0. We want to show that mu and mu are equal. OK, so how do we do that? We pick a set and try to show that they give us the same measure on any arbitrary set. So let's choose any, uh, say, A, any measurable A painted x. Okay, and let's look at mu of a. That's the same as let's doing this integral. <coughs> okay, and now I'm going to use my feasibility condition, just like I did for the transshipment problem, but it was a different feasibility condition. This time my feasibility condition is that mu is a marginal of pi, right? So that's what I need to, to use, that if I uh, take pi and I basically integrate away all the y dependents, I get back to mu. So if we integrate away all the y dependents, I integrate over my entire set, I should get back where I started. <coughs> OK, so I'm integrating over a bigger set. But as we observed, uh, over some of this, there is no mass, right? Um, we only have pi is only going to assign mass to places uh, where where, y is, where a is included in here, right? Uh, if we're living in a complement over here, there's no mass. So, so I could just as well simplify this to a cross a. Or I could just as well do the reverse. I could say, sure, this is A. Or I could enlarge this set a little bit. And that would do nothing, because I would just be adding elements of A complement. And if I have elements of A complement here and A here, again, there's no mass. It changes nothing. So I could say, this is the same as x cross A. <coughs> and what is that integral equal to? It's equal to new, exactly. Because now, again, we're going to use our feasibility condition that now we're integrating away the x dependence. We're looking at the marginal on y, and the marginal on y is new. Okay? So that means, indeed, these two measures were the same. We happy with those two conditions? OK, then the last one is the triangle inequality. Uh, so I'm going to maybe take the triangle. I'm going to take two tra passes at the triangle inequality. <coughs> uh, it's, it's much easier to do if we happen to have transport maps. So I'm going to start by, by proving the triangle inequality in this setting where we're doing Moja's problem, where we definitely have transport maps. Uh, and then we'll think about if we can generalize it to, to this setting here. So let's call this the proof of 1. <coughs> okay. When, <coughs> when these things do not give mass to small sets. Okay. 
Okay, and in that case, Moses problem makes sense. Okay, so let me let me try to visualize what's going on. Here I've got my mu. Here I've got my new that I'm trying to get to. <clears throat> but now I'm imagining going through an intermediate. <coughs> okay, I can define an optimal map from here to here. I'm going to call that T1. And I can define an optimal map from here to here, and I'm going to call that T2. Okay, so let T1, which pushes forward mu into sigma, and T2, which pushes forward sigma into nu, be uh, optimal mappings. Okay, once I have the mappings, then I have the ability to write down what the actual Wasserstein distance is between these two guys and these two guys. <clears throat> uh, now I also need a mapping between mu and nu. Um, I would like it ideally to somehow relate to these guys because I know something about these. Uh, so let's just start by writing down a feasible mapping. Okay, so this may not be optimal, but let's define T to be the composition of these two maps. Okay, so this is T2 composed with T1. All right, so it goes from here to here and then from here to here, or it's a mapping from here to here, in other words. Okay, T is feasible. T does push forward mu into nu. Uh, but it may not be optimal. So it may not be optimal. We can't assume that. <coughs> okay, but this is good enough for us to start getting some estimates on the Wasserstein metric between these two guys. So what do we have? We have that the Wasserstein metric between new and nu, uh, it's the infimum of this integral overall transport mapping. Um, I've got a non-optimal transport map, so this integral may have gone up. OK, but I can still write this down. Uh, this is going to be x minus t of x to the p uh, d mu. 1 over p. <coughs> okay, and this 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 feels like uh, a kind of LP norm of x minus t of x. It is an LP norm, oh, just not with respect to the Lebesgue measure. Uh, so I can I can write it that way. I can write this as uh, let's write it like this, i minus t, uh, LP norm, with respect to mu, okay, where i is an identity mapping. So where i of x is equal to x. Okay, why did I come over here into LP? I came to LP because I have a triangle inequality for LP, and I want to use it. <coughs> okay, so if I use my triangle inequality, I need to go through some intermediate mapping. Okay, so let's introduce an intermediate mapping. I minus T1 and 
T1 minus T. <coughs> and now I need to try to estimate, compute, or something each of these terms. OK, so let's see what I can do. Let's start with this guy. So I minus T1. Okay, so this is a big integral. So we're integrating, let's see, x minus t1 of x to the pth power against d mu and raising it to the 1 over p. Uh, what's another name for this integral? Right, so let's think about what T1 is doing. T1 is a map, in fact, it's an optimal map from mu into sigma, right? So now what have I done? I've taken x minus my optimal mapping to the pth power, integrated against, against mu, which is, which is my source. Uh, and this is optimal, right? So this is actually nothing but the Wasserstein metric between here and here. Yes? Okay. So this I can write as the Wasserstein metric between mu and sigma. <clears throat> okay, uh, and now I need to do the same kind of thing with the other term. My other term was t1 minus t. Okay, again, I can write this as an integral. Uh, t1 of x minus, let me write explicitly what t is. t is t2 of t1. To the p against d mu. Um, so I need to simplify this somehow. Uh, in particular, we actually know exactly what we'd like coming out here, right? Because we know what we're trying to prove. We're trying to prove a triangle inequality. We've already got the mu to sigma term. We'd love a sigma to nu term coming out, um, which means I, I really don't want to be integrating against mu at the end of the day. Uh, so how can I simplify this? What change of variables can I do that would clean this up for me? That's why it would be with T1 of x. That makes sense because T1 is floating around quite a bit. Okay, so I'll start letting y be T1. Okay, I'll leave a little space here. <clears throat> okay, but what measure am I integrating against now? D sigma, exactly. So we knew that T1, push forward of T1, of the push forward of mu through t1 was sigma. So by doing this substitution for t1, we end up going from mu to sigma. OK, now I look at what I've got written down here. T2 is now my optimal map from sigma to nu, right? where I'm integrating against sigma, which means this is nothing but the Wasserstein metric from here to here. So this is indeed Wasserstein uh, from sigma to nu. But I put it all together, and I get exactly the result that I wanted. So the Wasserstein metric from mu to nu 
is bounded by the sum where I go through an intermediate. Questions on that so far? That was Moja's problem. So that was under the assumption that I have maps, which I don't always have, depending on, on what I'm doing, if I'm thinking about continuous problems or discrete problems. OK, so more generally, I need to do this with transport plans. Uh, and I need some kind of analog of this condition that I have, if I have a plan from here to here, and I have a transport plan between here and here, how can I sort of read out of that some kind of transport plan that goes from here directly to here? Uh, so that's what we want to do. Oh, this is a little bit more work. <clears throat> so we need the analog of composing these maps. Okay, so more generally, Okay, by that I mean if we're solving the Kantorovich problem. <coughs> okay, let's suppose that. Okay, we've got our, our measures again. So mu is a probability measure on x. Nu is a probability measure on y. Uh, actually, sigma, I'll say, is a probability measure on y. And nu is a probability measure on set z. OK, uh, I'm going to do what I did before. Let me write a new diagram. Mu, sigma, and, and nu. And I have a plan that goes from here to here, plan between x and y. I'm going to call this pi xy. <clears throat> and a plan that goes from here to here that I'm going to call plan yz. OK, so we find somewhere out there optimal transport plans. <clears throat> pi xy, which goes between mu and sigma, and pi yz between sigma and mu. And somewhere out of this, I need to read off uh, a new transport plan that goes from here to here. So we want to find, to use these to find a feasible plan between mu and nu. OK, the way we're going to do this, we're going to uh, use what's called the gluing lemma. And it's going to let us take these two plans and essentially glue them together into, a, into an even bigger probability measure that lives now on this triple product space, x cross y cross z. Uh, and then from that, we're going to try to restrict back down to just these two sets. <coughs> OK, so let me write down. Gluing lemma. Okay, so let's suppose I have these two me measures, transport plans, okay, between mu x and mu y. I'm going to call everything mu labeled by what set it's in. I think it will make, make it easier to keep track here. Okay, and 
another one, pi yz, which goes from y to z. <coughs> okay, so what's important about this is I have two transport plans, two, two measures on, on these product spaces, but they have a common marginal, right? So the marginal of this guy on y is the same as the marginal of this guy on y, right? They both share a common marginal, uh, and that's, that's this in-between bit here. Okay, so that's what's important. <coughs> okay, so this lemma says, I can glue these together again into this, this kind of bigger probability measure. There exists a measure pi, uh, which is a probability measure now on x cross y cross z, this triple product space. <coughs> okay, and if we take this and we restrict it down, uh, if we restrict it down to just x and y, we recover this, and if we, so if we integrate away the z, we just get back to this, and if we integrate away the x, we just get back to this. Okay, so this is the limit. There exists a measure such that pi xy and pi yz uh, are the marginals of this big pi on either x cross y or y cross z. How do I build this thing? <clears throat> um, so here, we need the concept of uh, disintegration of a measure. But basically, I'm taking a measure on a product space, and I'm, and I'm kind of trying to factor it out in terms of its x dependence and its y dependence. OK, so we need this concept. of Disintegration of measure. Um, so in other words, uh, and this is sort of what you do when you're doing an iterated integral, for example. So given a measure on the product space on x cross y, <coughs> we can basically write it as some kind of average of many measures uh, on just one of the sets. <coughs> OK, in other words, pick any x that you like. For that fixed x, there's going to be a corresponding measure uh, over y. And for a different x, I'll get another measure over y. So for all x, there exists some pi sub x, which is a probability measure on the set y, such that, and for all reasonable functions phi, integrating phi. Okay, and this is where it feels like just doing an integrated integral. That, okay, instead of saying, okay, I've got a measure on the product space and I integrate over the product space, let's it, separate out the integrals and have an outer integral and an inner integral. We have our function that our integrand, and then we break up our, our measure here and say, well, first we integrate against y. 
So we have something that we're integrating against y. And then we have something that we're integrating against uh, x. And we can write this as pi equals, think of this as like a product measure. OK, so I'm going to use this fact that I can take my measures here that I can break them apart into their x and y dependence sort of separately and use those broken apart things to recombine them into a big measure. OK, so the gluing lemma. So I've got these two guys. They share a common marginal. <coughs> I'm going to disintegrate them. So I'm going to factor them just the way I talked about here. So let's disintegrate these guys, pi xy and pi yz. And what I want to keep lying around here is my final thing is this common marginal that they both share, which is d mu, which is mu uh, y. Okay, so let me <coughs> write them like this. I'm going to write pi xy as okay some. So for each y, I get a measure on x. And then my measure on y is determined by the marginal on y. And pi yz is going to be, OK, the marginal on y that I want to keep around. <coughs> and then for each fixed y, I get some measure on z. So pi yz, and this measure is different for each y. Now, all broken apart like this, I'm going to use them to define a new measure on this triple product space. So let's now define a measure pi like this. So I'm going to define it by the way it uh, acts on any given function. So we integrate over the product space. A uh, function now of three variables. Oh, I'm moving to the wrong board, aren't I? Let's come back here. x cross y cross z, phi of x, y, z, d pi. <coughs> OK, and now I'm going to try to break this all apart. So I have. Y, y is the thing where I have this common marginal. Uh, and then I will have some way that it depends on x and some way that it depends on z. OK, so I need a measure on z. A measure on z was given by, by this guy, right? I, I took this measure uh, that went from my y space to my z space. I pulled out my marginal on y. This was what was left on z. So let's keep that. Do the same thing for x. And then on y, I'm going to have just d mu y. <coughs> OK, 
Okay, so it's a it's a certainly a measure on on this triple product space. Now the big claim here is that this has the correct marginals, right? That I have this this measure that lives on all three of these spaces, but if I just restrict to these two, I get this measure back, and if I just restrict to these two, I get this measure back. That's what I want to show. So let's check the marginal of pi on, say, x cross y. So we integrate away the z-dependence. Uh, and if the z-dependence is gone, we want to recover this guy between x and y. <coughs> OK, so what happens? What do I have to check? Uh, here. I'm going to be interested in, uh, how will I write this? Oh, I'd be interested in cases where I can integrate away the z-dependence. Right, so in other words, I have no z-dependence here. And what I want to know is that this is the same as if I just integrated against, against this measure here that was defined on x and y. Okay, so let's try to write this out. What do I have? I'm going to put this in here. So I have my integral against y. I have my integral against x. I'm going to keep phi xy out here because it doesn't depend on z. Okay, and then I have all my measures. OK, I, I have this little integral on the inside. What is this integral equal to? One. It's equal to 1, exactly. So this guy here, right, he's, I, I don't know what he looks like exactly, but I know that he's a probability measure, right? And that means that I integrate him over the entire set, I have to get 1. So this whole integral is equal to 1 because this guy is a probability measure. OK, so what's left? I just have an integral over x and y. And what's left? These are exactly the terms that came up when I disintegrated pi xy. So uh, I can do this in two steps. but. But this is nothing but phi of x, y, and then integrated against this guy, which in the very beginning, we said that guy is nothing but this measure that we started with. So this is indeed phi integrated against d pi xy. And that's what we wanted to show. The marginal on x cross y was exactly what we wanted it to be. And you do the same argument. OK, the marginal okay, on y cross z is going to be pi yz. <coughs> so this is good. This means that if I go back to my triangle inequality, right, I have a plan that goes from, uh, where was it, from mu to sigma, and I have a plan that goes from sigma to nu. I can create a new plan, a new probability measure on this triple product space. And now I can restrict it to what happens between just x and z, 
right? Integrate away the y dependence and see what happens. That should give me a plan that now goes from here directly to here. <clears throat> okay, so if I go back to the triangle inequality, Okay, so let's let, again, pi xy uh, is a plan that goes from mu to sigma, and pi yz is a plan that goes from sigma to nu, and they're optimal. Okay, so we construct something that lives on... Uh, on this big set, as in the last lemma. <coughs> and the key is we want to show that, right? We know if we restrict to x cross y, we get, we get pi xy. We know if we restrict to y cross z, uh, we get pi yz. We want to show that if we restrict to x cross z, we should get a plan that goes from mu to nu. OK, so let's check the marginal on x cross z. Uh, actually, I'll say check. Let's define pi xz to be the marginal of pi on x cross z. And I want to show that this guy, this guy is a plan that goes from mu to nu. Okay, so for it to be a feasible plan, uh, not optimal necessarily, but feasible, we need to check its marginals. This is more measure theory than you'd bargain for today, I think. Uh, but bear with me a little longer. So let's uh, check the marginals say on x. So if we start with a set, <coughs> and we integrate away all the z dependents, okay, this guy came from integrating away all the y dependents in our giant measure. So this was the same as pi a cross y cross z. Um, and I know something about the marginals of this big measure, right? I know what happens, for example, if I integrate away all the z dependents. If I integrate away all the z dependents, I get back to pi xy. And what is this equal to? It's mu of a, exactly. So pi xy. By definition, we were given what its marginals had to be, right? And its marginal on x is mu. So in other words, if I integrate away all the y dependents, I don't see the sigma. I just see mu now. So this is indeed mu of a. OK, and with the same argument, if we uh, went x cross b, we get mu of b. <coughs> so this is a feasible plan. It was a composition of maps is a lot easier than cobbling together a feasible plan here. Uh, but we've done it in the end. We've come up with a feasible plan. So this goes from mu to nu. It may not be optimal. But now, now I'm in business to start estimating my Wasserstein metric. OK, so WP from mu to nu right, is bounded by whatever happens when I try to integrate my cost against this measure. 
because this is feasible. Okay, so I'm going x cross z, x minus z to the p, uh, d pi x z, 1 over p. Okay, this guy, remember this guy came from our, our giant measure pi. Uh, so we know that if we add in an integral over the set y, we just go back to integrating against pi. So this is x cross y cross z of x minus z to the p d pi. I do that. I want to bring in y because I want to relate going from mu to sigma and sigma to nu. And if we're bringing sigma into the mix, I need some kind of integral over y. OK, and this, this again, just like before, looks like an LP norm. <coughs> and if it's an LP, then I can do triangle inequality. OK, so. Bounded by x minus y plus y minus z. Okay, and now, I mean, the structure of this proof is proceeding exactly the way that it did when we had transport maps now. Uh, we're just writing things in terms of this, in, in terms of these measures instead of the transport plans. OK, so if I write down what these are explicitly, I have an integral over x cross y cross z of x minus y d pi. And then an integral of y minus z to the p. Okay, if I look at what I'm trying to integrate here, right, there's no z dependence, right? So I don't need to work with pi here. I just need to work with its marginal on x cross y, right? It's marginal on x cross y. We just find to be pi x y. Same game over here. What I'm integrating here has no x dependence, so I don't need to integrate against pi. I can integrate away the x dependence and just work with the marginal on y cross z. Again, we know what the marginal on y cross z is. We call that pi y z. Okay, what's this quantity? This distance from mu to sigma, exactly. So right at the very first line of this, this, this result, we said let's define pi xy to be the optimal transport plan from mu to sigma, right? So now here we go. We're integrating our cost function against this optimal plan from mu to sigma. This gives us the Wasserstein p distance from mu to sigma. And right at the beginning, we said, let's let pi yz be the optimal transport plan from sigma to nu. So now we get our Wasserstein distance from sigma to nu. And that's the result we wanted. This is our triangle inequality. So in fact, the Wasserstein metric is actually a metric. Yeah. 
exist. Yes. You don't need them to be optimal for them to exist, no. The only place where I wanted them to be optimal was in this line. In fact, you don't even need to know that you can construct optimal measures here. Uh, you can just get things that give you arbitrarily close to the optimal value. So even if you only have an infimum and not a minimum, you can still pull this through. Other questions? It's a, it's a lot to digest today, I know. Um, so next class, we will not be doing such intense measure theory. Um, I want to talk about a few other properties uh, of these Wasserstein metrics that end up being important uh, for the applications. Um, so we'll probably finish that next class and then start looking at some application to geophysics, I think.